Hello, and welcome to another episode of Amiga Retro Adventures. Today's going to be a quick tutorial on how to, as you can kind of barely see down there, that itty bitty piece of electronics, to, there we go, focus. It's always good to have things in focus. Anyways, the quick tutorial on how to install an SD card into the Vampire SD card inside the computer. Um, there are some tutorials or instructions uh, online that you can find even directly from the people, uh, the Apollo team that makes the Vampire. But this will be kind of a condensed version and hopefully it's a bit easier to follow. Not that it's an extremely complex procedure, but uh, for the unexperienced or inexperienced it may be a tad daunting. So hopefully this will help uh, clear that up a bit. So what I'm going to do first is take this card off of here, zoom out a bit, and move that up a bit. There we go. Take the top off here. Excellent, because I have to gain access. Ideally turn off the computer as well. Before I do this, computer is off. The chair out of the way. Okay, here we go. Why that looks so. So, as you can hopefully see, as I zoom in once again, there is the SD card slot right here. Without getting my finger too much in the way. Of course, the compact flash for the boot drive is here. You can't boot off of these drives, the uh, secure digital, the SD card slots, but they make a great storage device. And by default, the Coffin OS, which I highly recommend you install, that takes complete advantage of the Vampire and gives you a lot of software. Um, by default, the uh, Coffin OS does not come with uh, like a, a mounted SD0 or SD card uh, type device. So I will, in, this is a 16 gigabyte SAN disk and I highly, highly recommend that you use the uh, out of focus uh, <laughs> disk device. Um, I have pretty good luck with these cards. I have issues for some reason with Kingston's. Um, they work okay if they're DOS uh, formatted, like set up for the DOS file system. I think FAT95 for the Amiga, but I want to use PFS, which is uh, good for these because uh, file recovery, sorry, file recovery, built-in redundancies, uh, especially when they're writing, and it's much more robust than either FAT95 or uh, the regular fast file system for the Amiga. Anyway, enough of that. So it is installed. I will put everything back together again, and I will join you on the capture card, and you'll see the workbench, hopefully, of my Vampire Amiga 500, and we shall go from there. I will be right back. Hello. As you can see, I am now at the Amiga Workbench. And just to let you know before we start, everything that you see me do, pretty much, all the software is installed as part of the Coffin OS Revision 54. So you don't have to go on the internet and re-download anything or Aminet or anywhere else. Everything that I'm using here is part of this installation. So it makes things much, much easier. So the first thing we, did, uh, the first thing we need to do is to make sure that the SD card that I inserted into the SD card slot on the Vampire is compatible. So let us open up the command prompt, which is kind of represented very nicely here by this icon. And type in SD Diag. Now this is the program that's gonna basically do a diagnostic on the SD card and make sure everything looks okay. And success. It's been detected. Block size, total blocks, and capacity 15 gigabytes, which is pretty close to the 16. And that's pretty much it. So we know this works. Now, if you get an error of some kind or whatever, then uh, you can always try cleaning the con, like you know, taking out the card, cleaning the contacts, maybe on the card in the socket itself, like the SD card slot, I should say. And uh, if you still get the error even after those attempts, you would probably have to try a different SD card because there's a good chance that. Uh, 
it's not compatible with the vampire and i except for the kingston it, uh, like i said i have weird issues with the kingston drives it shows up fine here but for some reason unless it's fat 95 file system uh it doesn't like anything else it seems like if i use the uh, professional file system which i'm about to do now it works somewhat but i get lots of write errors and other weird things start happening and it's just bad so i highly recommend using the the sandisk models they seem to be very compatible and very compliant okay that being said everything looks fine here we need to go into the system folder into tools and as you can see i've already made an hd toolbox because we need to use hd toolbox now hd toolbox here is going to use the standard SCSI device which is going to use of course as you've seen earlier at the beginning of this episode uh, it, it basically controls the uh, it's the interface for the compact flashcard which the os boots off of but i made one specifically for the sega um, sd device and all it is is i copied this into ram here i can show you copied it into here went into ram you can right click on that information icon um, ask device is selected uh, that it actually makes it easier initially because you can when you run it it'll actually ask you what device you want to connect hd toolbox to but you know, for simplicity once if you specify like in here it just goes right into it and it's a, it's a bit quicker saves you some time but all i did was edit this take off these brackets because brackets basically comments it out and then i put in sega sd dot device click on save now i can run it from here and uh it would work just fine but i wanted to copy just for future use if i got a different sd card or whatnot and of course i just renamed it like so just like you see there Whoop. One second. Sega SD. Oops. Small S. Not anymore. And as you can see, you see? Yeah. And uh, I'll just replace this. Replace. There we go. And that's all I did. Now I have two versions. I have the version that runs the uh, SCSI device, which, like I, like I said, is a default Amiga device for hard drives and, and whatnot. And now I have one specifically configured for the Sega SD. Okay. Let's move this out of the way. So now that it's configured, I shall run this. And as you can see, I didn't make a typo because it's actually showing the interface, which is the Sega SD dot device. And of course it detects the card. So I'm gonna click on this. Now this hasn't been installed or configured previously. So it's telling me that, I'll click okay. Now be de uh, <laughs> sorry about that. By default, it loads everything in. I always like to click on reconfiguration, just make sure nothing changes, that it uh, everything's in there okay, and I it looks just fine. Now this is why I left this window open here. See this number here, total blocks? It ends with like 6288. It's the same here, and blocks, uh, bytes per block. So now I know this is configured right, everything is good to go. And I just click on install, click OK. OK, close this window here. Now we still have to partition the drive. Now we've made it available to the system, but now we have to define partitions. Now by default, uh, HD Toolbox in um, under OS 3.9, which is the flavor that uh, the Vampire, uh, the Coffin OS is running, uh, segments it into pretty much four chunks, which is almost four gigabytes, kind of makes sense, four times four, 16. So what I'm gonna do is you can delete, I just want one partition. I will delete these three and make sure that's all the way over it starts at two and slide this all the way to the maximum capacity of 17363 and it looks good everything is good indeed okay so we have one partition uh there's the partition size we're going to change this to, you can just call this sd0 it's fine Hit enter. You can always make sure you hit enter because with GAD tools, if you don't, uh, it will simply ignore that entry. And if you come back in here again, it'll be back to that like VDH0 and, and stuff. So that's, uh, that's okay now. Now what we have to do is change the file system. And this is where the PFS has to be, uh, become loaded. So I need to click on add update. As you can see, the fast file system was already in here, version 45.16 we do not need this so i shall delete it delete oh, it's gone 
Now we need to add the new file system. This will be the PFS, a professional file system. Click on that. It'll default to the L directory, which anyone that's been with the Amiga for a bit will know that's where all handlers and file systems and fun stuff reside. And if you look for it, there's the PFS right there. PFS three all in one. That looks good. And I will click on load. So as you can see, it's version 19.2 and the file size. You can see here though, it's still FSS. F -f -f -f. <laughs> uh, I suck. Fast file system. We need to change the identifier right here. And this number, I just, uh, you need to enter it the same as I do. And don't ask me, I, it had to be researched or it was in the previous document that I read. This is the only reason why I know this number. I'm not making this one up. So I believe it's 504-45303. And then hit enter and PDS. Now it could be PFS if I put in like say a six here instead of a four, hit enter. It shouldn't make any difference, but I it's always worked from the get-go with PDS, like four four instead of four six. And as the saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it works just fine. I shall leave as is. So everything looks good. Click on OK. Excellent. Now we're still not quite done yet. It's still saying international uh, fast file system. Well, it's because we've added it here, but we need to change it for this partition. Any partition, actually, if you had several partitions, you can assign different file systems to them if you want. But for consistency, and obviously we only have one, I'm going to select the one we just created. So as you can see, standard file system, which is fast file system, as you can see right here, is selected by default. Click on this, and there is the one that we just loaded in and created. Everything else in here, leave it. We don't have to change anything. Click on OK. And they also recommend in the manual and other readings I came across to give it 150 buffers. Now, a word of caution here, make sure this is done last. If I put this in and then change the file system, it will default back to 80 again. So make sure this is your last step. Okay, so we're done here. Everything looks good. Everything looks fine. Click on save. And okay, and it's going to want to reboot as soon as I click exit. And rebooting it does. And we shall wait for one moment. This thing boots pretty quick, so it won't be a very long wait at all. Okay, so we have the partition parameters and the drive definitions all sorted out through HD Toolbox. And now what we will do is go into the system directory or system drive, I should say, DH0, and under utilities or not, under tools. Nope, I have lied to you twice. How about system? Excellent. See, if I lied to you three times, it's game over, but just twice. Sorry. There's a tool called SD mount on and off. And I actually will mount the SD partition if it already exists. If you don't have it like auto loading through like in here, devs, like whatever's in here. And uh, DOS drivers will load when the computer boots up. Um, you can manually have it mount the uh, SD card. But it does more than just that. It also creates the required components. It uses Giggle Disk, which we could create by using the shell. But since this does it for us, and it does it a much better job than Giggle Disk, disk does by itself, with extra commands and stuff, um, it makes the mount file that we require for the DOS driver. So what we'll do is I'll close this up. I will double click on this. Now it doesn't seem like anything happened. Because remember, we didn't create a the the, uh, the mount file previously, so it's not going to mount it. But it does create the mount file, and this is exactly what we need. So double click on that. Nothing seemed to happen. Watch. We'll go into directory opus, and we will navigate to the RAM drive into the temp folder. And look, there's SD mount. There it is. So it created the uh, the DOS driver mount file right here the file system, the device, all of that. 
So this used Google disk, as you can see right here, but it generated everything for us without having to type in commands. And if it's an easier route, I will take it, especially as I get older, because hills become tougher to climb. Yes. So I shall close this off right now. Now, the only thing I don't like about this is this hideous looking icon. I don't desire this icon at all. So one way around this, and this is a bit of a segue from our tutorial, but this can come in handy. Click on cancel, go into RAM, into T, into SD mount, there it is. I could run this right now, and in theory, it should mount the drive, but we're not gonna do this. I wanna change this icon. There's a program, and like I said, this program comes installed with the Coffin OS, Revision 54. If you go into Tools, and this is one of my favorite, it's called Copy Icon. So I just double click on that. So what it does, whatever you put in here becomes the reference image or the image you want to copy. And when you, whatever you drag over here, it will copy the image too. And the, beauty thing, the beautiful thing about this is it doesn't overwrite the information. It just changes the icon image. So if you have weird looking icons and it can batch do them, you can drag a whole bunch in there as well. It doesn't matter. So what I'm going to do is close this because I don't need it anymore. And we're going to find the icon that we want. So if we're going to go to devs, DOS drivers, since it's already one here, we're going to grab this, put that there. So there's your image that we desire. And if I go back into SD mount and click here, there we go. Now it looks nice. And then I, like I said, it retains the information in the icon. So if you go to icons and information and then the icon tab, it's all still there. And this doesn't, except for activate, Nothing else really needs to be in here because it's already defined in the uh, the mount file for the DOS driver, but we'll leave it there. It won't hurt anything. Okay. So what I can do at this point, I could go to directory opus, but you know what? Let's just drag and drop things. I have a habit of closing all windows. I don't know why I do that. Maybe I just like open spaces. I do live in a country, you know, maybe that's why. Mm. But anyway, we will go into system and DOS drivers. Now you could dump this into storage DOS drivers, but you would, uh, not data types, DOS drivers. You could um, pretty much launch them from here, either in your user startup or click on them manually. I want the uh, card to be mounted when the computer boots. So that's system, the system folder, DH0, devs, DOS drivers. Let's copy that over into here. Okay, and let me clean this up. Uh, clean up by type and resize to fit and snapshot all. There we go. So just to make sure this works properly, um, I'm just gonna reboot the computer one more time. Actually, I might, might have to boot it one more time after this one more time, but we'll see. Okay, let's see if it comes up. There we go. So it's been mounted. Um, the thing here is though, it says un uninitialized, it needs to be formatted. So right click on that, no, it lies, left click on that and select format right there. Okay, I do not like the trash can. It's pretty much useless unless you have a third party utility. The way the Amiga doesn't really, it's just a folder that yeah, it's a long story. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we will continue. I'm going to call this backups. Make sure you hit enter and do a quick format. If you click on long format, especially with an SD card, it'll take a long time. And uh, you know, we don't have a long time here. So let's click on quick format. Yes, you're about to format this disk. Warning, you're still going to lose more data if you, and then the, uh, nag requester, I guess it's free. So who cares? Just click on okay and then wait. Oops, sorry about that. Hit that with my finger, I did. Perfect. Now you notice it's a bit ghosted and there's a reason for that. Before you try to position this and do other fun stuff with it so it loads up in the same spot, it's missing the disk info. So disk.info file, like all of these drives have that give them their icons to show up when they boot. So let's take care of that first. So let's use our friend directory opus. Let's go to SD0. I already have F SD0 configured for in direct directory opus, so it's no different than hitting CD SD0 and it shows up. 
except for this one, of course, which shows up in the interface. Click, yes. So of course it lies horribly. It says 1.9 gigabytes free, but if we go back here and open it up, we know better than that. It's actually 13.8, yes. It's a directory opus. I'm not sure, I think they fixed this on OS 4. There was a report to OS 4 of the older version of directory opus, which I like because it's just faster, um, which takes care of this. It's just uh, probably just using 32-bit um, or 16-bit something to that effect, uh, referencing. That's why it just doesn't work. I think anything over two gigabytes, it gets confused. So yeah, it's, so it's basically, yeah, 32 bit. So it needs 64 bit or higher to read properly. And that's all the issue is there. But once again, I have segued off. Okay, here we are. We're in the backups folder, which is SD zero, backups drive, I mean. What we will do now is we need a disk.info in there. And the reason why I say that, if I go to system, you'll see, oh, look, there's disk info. And look, it looks like that. That's where the magic happens. Hey, yes, I'm, I'm way too excited about this kind of stuff. Okay, SD0 we are. So I need a disk info in there. So the easiest way to do that is we're going to go, you're gonna, sorry, we're going to type in envarc colon SYS. Envarc is envarchive, it's just the short form for it that gets assigned and SYS is a folder within. I will hit enter. This is basically where, as you can see, it hides lots of uh, default images for drives, floppy disks, uh, pretty much everything. So we're gonna go down to the SD0 one, if I don't get lost in this soup of things. There we go. So if I have a double click on this, that's what it looks like. It looks like the other one, but this won't be ghosted. So you need to, all you have to do is copy this and rename it at the same time, which works really well in directory opus while I'm using it. So I'm gonna click on this one here. So default underscore sd0.info. Click on copy as. And it's gonna be called disk.info. And click on copy. As you see, it is there. It looks nice. Okay, we're pretty much, I'm gonna leave this open, but we're pretty much done here. Actually, I'm not, I lied again. I'm gonna quit this. So now you can see it's not ghosted. And the beauty of this now is now I can position this, the icon itself and the window. I'm gonna move this up here, roughly. Okay, I'm gonna open this for reference and I'm going to reposition this window so it looks nice right there. I'm gonna snapshot all and make sure I snapshot this icon as well. So to make sure this sticks, one more reboot. Yes, I just wish we could reboot our lives sometimes. Wouldn't that make things so much simpler? Like redos or infinite lives. Hmm. Interesting. Look at that. Beauty, A. Eh? That's the Canadian content for this show. Thank you very much. And here we go. Uh, yes, Canadian I am even though I pretty much spend most of my life in the US working, but oh well, both countries are awesome. So what we're gonna do now is um, make sure this actually will hold data. I mentioned before, when I tried to use the Kingston drives using the exact same procedure with the professional file system, it would initially seem fine, but as soon as you start copying files, you would get horrible errors, write errors, weird areas that only the programmer would know mean. And then of course, system lockups and crashes and fun stuff like that. So we're gonna go back to, yes, you guessed it, directory opus and SD zero, there we go. And I just happen to have some uh, files I can move over. So under programs, which I, I'm already on, temp folder, SD zero, these are just my files. And then there's a bunch of goodies in here. So we're gonna copy this click on copy and the process begins. And like I said, with, uh, with the Kingston drive, with this file system, I don't know what was going on. I'm not sure if it's a compatibility issue with the file system, with the vampire, with uh, who knows what. So like I have mentioned before, please use the SanDisk drives. They work just fine. I think I'm using the SanDisk uh, Ultra. It's a 16 gigabyte. I have a 64, it works fine. I imagine the eights are fine. I just don't know what it is with the Kingston, which is kind of weird because Kingston, especially when it comes to PCs, are usually the uh, fallback memory if you're having issues with your computer booting, but oh well. But anyway, we will, uh, or should I say I, will join you 
when this uh, is completed. I'll be back in one moment. And actually that didn't take too long. It uh, maybe about three, four minutes to copy 203 megabytes thereabouts. And as you can see, if I go into downloads here, so this is the destination, which was the SD card backups. And if I go into the source, which is basically DH1, and do a quick file compare. So I'll select all that, get sizes, and select all of this. I could just click on all, I guess, get sizes. As you can see, it will tell you there's 213,689 for 11. Exactly the same. And it went perfectly, no errors, unlike the aforementioned uh, Kingston drives. Yes, works really, really, really well. So I can't complain at all. And that pretty much wraps that up. I hope uh, this tutorial wasn't too quick and it was informative. And uh, I do have more videos coming up, so you should really subscribe to my channel if you feel like it. Make sure you share, like, and leave your comments, or you can even dislike if you don't like my voice for some reason. Or whatever um, it's up to you opinions opinion and uh, that's pretty much it like always thank you for watching